going on a test shoot tonight. This is a new vlog format I'm trying out to see if anyone likes it. Uh, if you don't, then I won't bother. But uh, my point about this video is really to try something new in terms of a vlogging format. Probably a way for you guys to see more of my personality than the other videos that I make on the channel, which are primarily for education and it's, you know, they're, they're, they're very structured. Um, if you think that I'm reading off a teleprompter in those videos, that's because I am. And uh, the reason I do that is because I'm trying to value your time. And by making each sentence as efficient as possible, uh, I can do that. But the only way I can do that is to write it out and uh, between you and me it's not something I really enjoy too much so these those videos take a long time to make these ones hopefully I can whip out a lot faster and uh, get more out to you in a shorter amount of time so yeah let me uh, get on the subway and uh, I'll uh, explain what this video is about <laughs> So you know you're a vlogging newbie when you want to hit record and uh, you suddenly find yourself too embarrassed uh, recording next to a bunch of fellow subway train passengers. So rookie mistake for me, but I guess uh, this is what you get the first time doing this. Anyway, getting to this video. Uh, my point is about, it revolves around a, a certain question I posted on Facebook recently in a few photography groups and uh, the question I posed was um, this is car specific and I think a lot of you know you viewers are, are interested in car photography but my question was if it was necessary to shoot uh, nice exotic cars uh, for your portfolio and um, you know I posed it in, in, in that way hoping people, you know, would give me an honest answer. And I think most people did because they said that uh, it doesn't matter what, how nice the car is as long as you can capture a good image. Yet at the same time, of course, fully acknowledging that in the world of Instagram, um, if you post a nice picture of a Ferrari or any photo of a Ferrari Lamborghini, it's going to get more likes. So if you want likes, uh, I think the consensus was uh, shoot nice cars. But uh, if you want to be a good photographer, I think that's something else. So um, based on that question and answer, I'm taking it a step further. I'm doing a shoot tonight, but it's going to be removing the car altogether. So if you guys are expecting to see a car shoot, uh, this is not it. But before you guys click off, uh, please know that my point is um, photography is not really about the subject matter at all. I think we just proved that with a question and answer about the, the, you know, exotic cars. If you take the car completely away, um, can you still make a good image? And of course you can. I mean, there are other great photographers out there shooting other things that are not car related. So obviously the answer is yes, you can. But uh, my point about this is that you can improve your car photography by shooting other things than cars. I think sometimes you're too far locked into the rabbit hole of shooting cars and that uh, that may lead to a bit of tunnel vision and that um, you may not be able to see other possibilities. And the only other way to see those possibilities is to shoot other things. So that's what I plan to do today. So let me use an analogy here. Say, you know, you like music, right? And uh, you probably have your favorite genre of music. But you probably like 
or at least appreciate other types of music as well. And um, maybe you can appreciate your favorite type of music even more by listening to other types of music. So this is the same thing with photography. I think that uh, you might have your favorite. You might be. You might love shooting cars, but you know, looking at other types of imagery, shooting other types of imagery, may make you appreciate car photography even more. So that's what I'm doing tonight. I'm shooting architecture, and I'm shooting it in a place that I've been to before. I've shot here quite a few times before, but uh, not this way. And uh, I love this place. I mean, you know, M, M plus. Uh, I did the Koenigsegg Yesco uh, CGI thing here. Uh, I haven't really shot it at night, so this will be interesting. And I only have less than two hours to do it, which you know makes me a little bit nervous. Combined with the fact that I'm trying to shoot a vlog at the same time, I don't know if I have enough time. So that's a little bit tricky. But uh, I hope to get some good imagery out of it. I have a very bare bones. Uh, equipment kit here. I only have a camera, one lens, which is the 35, and uh, a tripod, and an RGB LED light, and that's it. So um, I believe that it's important to make the most of what you got, and the best way to do that is to start with very little. So I think I can do it. I think uh, I'll probably do some light painting, with the architecture, you can probably see it right here as I just turn the corner. Let me give you this view. Yeah, so this is the place, which is still quite busy, a little bit windy, but uh, yeah, it's pretty dark. But uh, hopefully you can get some good shots. The best shots are in the front because the city lights are still on. They don't uh, turn off until about 10.30. Not that it's important. I don't really need them in the background or anything like that because I'm shooting away from the, uh, the building lights. It's a good dog walking place, you can see. But, uh, yeah, cool place. Let me uh, get to the spot and uh, I'll pick it up there. Here we go. Not bad, huh? Uh, it, looks, it gets even better once you turn the corner. It's one of these cities, I tell you. It's uh, quite a view at night, especially from uh, this side of the pond. Let me just brighten it up a bit. There you go. So just to drive that point home, if you were to take away the exotic car and replace it with a regular car, can you still shoot a nice shot? Answer is yes. What if you take that a step further and take away the car completely? Can you still take a nice shot? The answer should be still yes. I think that a lot of people kind of start categorizing photographers, um, probably unknowingly, uh, but uh, it does some damage. And I think that photographers mostly don't want to be pigeonholed into being perceived as only capable of shooting certain things and incapable of shooting other things, which is, you know, BS. So uh, even if, like for me, I may be known to shoot cars, I love to shoot other things. Um, I love shooting people. I love shooting landscapes. Um, and I may not have enough of that in my book. And that's what uh, tonight is about. So the deal is, we have, what time is it now? It's probably an hour and a half until closing. So I have to kind of shoot. Uh, I'll be happy with five shots. Uh, but it's going to take a long time because it's going to be timed exposures, long exposures, light painting involved. And uh, I particularly chose this place because, as you can see, it's really dark here. Like, like This area over here is like particularly dark. So... Uh, I need it that dark to get long exposures without blowing out highlights. So I have to be careful about what specific areas I pick. But, um, you know, just to get some very clean yet different looking type of uh, architecture shots would be cool. And um, who knows, if, uh, if this works out, I might learn a thing or two and 
be able to apply it back to my car photography stuff. And that's the whole point, is to break away from shooting something you love or, you know, comfortable shooting and uh, shoot something else. And hopefully that enables you to learn something that you otherwise couldn't do. So let's get started. Okay, so this is the first spot. As you can see, just a plain wall, nothing special, right? But uh, I'm going to do something with this corner right here. Um, I'm going to probably have light on one color shining this way and another light shining a different color going that way, you know, uh, split down the middle by the corner itself. So as you can see, it's not a, it's not a, a special corner. It's just uh, something very, that's the, the point. Because if I chose something complicated and then light painted on top of that, it will be even more complicated in the end. So try to keep things, you know, starting off with as clean a slate as possible and also dark enough because I need enough seconds uh, to do the light painting. I need about 20 seconds or so. And if I even point the camera slightly to the left, you can see how much brighter that area is or to the right. So... Um, this is actually just a very small sliver of space that I can actually shoot with, at least in this area over here. So, um, yeah, let's get cracking. Okay, just double check the camera. It's, uh, focus is on manual, already preset. I don't want the focus, autofocus to turn on and throw it off. So I might get like one or two shots that are off focus. Better just to get it right, switch it to manual, and then just leave it there. And uh, 25 seconds, F8, ISO 100, go. I'm just gonna walk in and turn on the light right now. And start here, maybe go up. As high as I can reach it. Come back down. And then up again. I don't know how much time I have, how many passes I can do in 25 seconds. I think that's enough. Okay, so I want to take a look at this. It's kind of cool, kind of interesting. Um, this may turn out pretty cool. I just have to kind of even out my painting a bit. But uh, yeah, I think there's potential. Let's keep going. Try another one. One, two, go. <laughs> It takes another equivalent amount of shutter speed time, in this case 25 seconds, to do I think what it's called a black exposure, which basically it shoots another blank frame to record the noise and then the camera internally kind of takes out the noise or dead pixels. That's pretty cool. It's blown out, but pretty cool. We see it here. I gotta turn down my light. I think my light's too bright. One more time. Four roll. Eight. can't turn the light off fast enough. Okay, time for the blue one. Hmm, not bad. Let me do another one. 
and go. Check it out. Nice. Love it. Nice. And take a closer look. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, yeah, it's pretty good, man. Better than the right side. Uh, next shot. I'm running out of time, so I can't uh, move away too far from the previous one, which was just around this corner. So I'm exposing a base exposure now, uh, just bracketing a few things. Basically, it's this shot. Again, nothing special. It's just a wall with some pillars in it. I do like that um, kind of background glow right about here, right? So that's, that comes out quite nicely. So I'm going to backlight these pillars using those two colors that I just did over there around the corner. And uh, as you can see, I still got 13 seconds left. And we'll see, you know, I might get three shots tonight if I'm lucky. Uh, short of the five that I wanted to do, of course, but uh, that's it. And just to let you know, thanks Fuji for loaning me the uh, X-T5. Not X-T5, sorry, X-T50. Which is, uh, so far, pretty decent, you know. Bang for the buck, you know, you get 40 megapixels. Uh, 35 mil, 1.4, of course, not shooting at 1.4 for this, so I'm not using that lens to its maximum potential. But either way, that's it. My tried and trusted Gitzo tripod, travel edition, so this thing is pretty light. Carbon fiber, of course. And that's it, you know? Okay, let's do first exposure. 25 seconds again, and go. Now I just have to mix that with orange, the other color that I did before, and we should be good. Let's try again. These people just love to walk right by. Yeah, that's perfect. Oh, good thing I haven't shot yet. <sighs> All right, one more. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Just spraying and praying a little bit here. So I did three shots. I didn't show the last one because I thought that this place was going to close. But apparently it doesn't. It's open 24-7. Uh, but anyway, I'm tired. I quit at three. I think three is fine. Um, I kind of like to do odd number, you know, sets. So if I had to shoot four shots, I would have to shoot five. And uh, I'm too tired to shoot five right now. I want to go home. So three is fine for me. And uh, I'll see you on the post-production side. Okay, so this is capture one. And these are the first three shots. Well, the only three shots that I did. Uh, starting with this one here. Uh, you can see this one here, this one here, and then this one here. This is the one that I didn't film. But uh, just to show you what we started off with, which is basically nothing special, just photos of the concrete environment. And the trick was to kind of light paint it to make it look a bit more stylish. So if I t show you... Um, if I show you everything I shot, uh, we got images like this with the light painting. Two primary colors, basically. So we have a blue and we also have a yellow. And they're complementary colors, so uh, they will contrast each other quite nicely. Uh, but also there are other colors that I realized uh, that were creeping into the shots as I was shooting. So, for example, if you take a look at this image here, there were some yellow greenish type of color coming in from the ambient lights around the environment 
So I figured instead of getting rid of them, try to include them into the images and at the same time keep that color consistent throughout the three images as well. So this green is one of them and there's also another magenta color which I'm not sure if I can show you in the raws but they are slightly over in this area right here. So that's um, four colors actually, two main colors and two kind of secondary colors. Okay, so what I usually like to do, whether I'm working with a retoucher or not, is to pick one image out of the entire set. In this case, there's only a, you know three to choose from. But this image will act as a reference, as a foundation to do all the retouching on. So I will retouch this image until it's about 90% complete. At that point, I will know whether I like it or not, uh, if it's going in the right direction. And if I do like it, I can lock down a lot of that look and feel in terms of the colors, uh, the lighting, the contrast, everything basically is can be locked down and then I can copy and paste that look to the remainder of the images. So in this case, the other two images. And if when doing it this way, I can end up with the entire set of images having a consistent look and feel. So that has to be based on something. That's why I'm picking one image to work on first, as opposed to working on all the images simultaneously and then trying to figure things out. I think it's a bit too complicated doing it that way. One image first to 90% done, and then uh, copy and paste that look to the remainder of the images. So in this case, I picked uh, my first shot that I did uh, you can see three images here, and I actually only picked, uh, I'm probably going to only use this one here and this one here. Uh, I did shoot this one as a base with no light painting. It's a just-in-case shot. Uh, I wanted a, just a safety net to know that I got a shot that did not have any light painting, just ambient light, straight shot. Um, something to note as well here is the exposures. You can see that in this case, you know, everything's to the left of the histogram, but you can clearly see that uh, the shadow area is fine. There's not much information uh, lost. So that goes for this image. And also uh, this image is the same. And uh, this image is the same. The shadow areas have enough detail, even though everything is pretty dark. Okay. And there's not a lot going on uh, in the midtones until you get the highlights, which of course is the, the bright uh, light painting I did. Same goes for here. It spikes at the very end, which is of course, you know, the bright highlights you see over here. But the midtones are pretty dead. Now, of course, in the base image, it looks a bit different because there is no light painting, so there's no spike on the highlights. But uh, that's it. Um, I will export these out and bring it over to Photoshop. Uh, in terms of exporting, just to give you a quick idea. Um, I export into directly into a Photoshop file, PSD. And uh, something of note is ICC profile is Adobe RGB. I don't work in sRGB until the very end. I usually work in Adobe RGB um, up until the very end. And then at least I know have, I, I have the gamut of colors uh, right up until the very end. So my final file is, 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 has good color information. And then I will convert it to sRGB if it goes on the web or any digital format. But at least uh, I, I maintain the Adobe RGB color gamut as long as I can. So that's one thing. I chose to use a 16-bit uh, export in this case, but um, you don't need to. I just, uh, I, I suppose if you have the hard drive space, just export 16-bit. Now it, it just gives you a bit more flexibility depending on how far you're going to push those files. I don't know how far I'm going to be, but uh, I think uh, I might because those uh, bright areas in the light painting uh, could be problematic. So 16-bit is better. And in this case, um, you know, XT50 Fujifilm is yielding... Uh, a 227 megabyte file, which is pretty large for such a tiny camera. Um, pretty impressive camera, I, I would say. I mean, I don't do camera reviews, but 
as you know. But uh, it's fine. Works great. Um, you know, you're shooting at 100 ISO, so you don't have to worry about uh, noise, even though it was a low light situation. Uh, that's, you know, one good thing about using tripods at night is that you don't, if you shoot at a low ISO and you have the camera locked down, you don't have to worry about any noise, no matter what kind of camera you have, as long as you shoot at a low ISO. Anyway, so uh, export uh, we go, and then I'll see you over in Photoshop. Okay, so in Photoshop, I started with the base layer. I didn't use the ambient um, exposure as a base layer. It was a backup. I don't think I need it for this uh, shot. So I actually skipped that one and moved directly into the light painting of the blue light using that as my base layer. Uh, so that's what you see here um, at the bottom. Now, what I did was I did the work ahead of time because uh, I find it very difficult to actually do the retouching work and uh, talk to the camera and explain my process all at the same time. So what I did was I did the work and now I will just uh, go through with you step by step, uh, layer by layer, what I did, okay? So when I shot this image, I didn't see certain things, um, partly because um, I didn't have my laptop with me. I didn't bring it because the camera I was testing, which was the Fujifilm X-T50, uh, does not have tethering capability with Capture One yet at the time of this recording. So they still don't have a compatible uh, solution to tether to the computer. So I didn't bring the computer. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't available, that option. Uh, it does recognize the Fujifilm RAW files. That's easy. But the tethering part wasn't working yet. So until that update comes, I just left my computer at home shot with the without a computer just looking at the back screen of the camera which of course is limiting you can't see everything and that's why i like shooting with a computer so i have a big screen to look at and what i missed was the fact that my camera tripod was casting a shadow in front of the camera i guess there was a light source behind the camera obviously because uh there, there needs to be light to light up all this area and um i didn't see the shadow so you can see the shadow actually right here in this area, right? I had the tripod and also next to it, I had another selfie stick tripod um, of my iPhone uh, filming the behind the scenes. So unfortunately, it's there. I have to get rid of it. And I like to use a lot of generative AI, uh, especially for, I know what the limits are. So I like to use it when I can. It's quite easy. You just have to know not to work on such large areas. Um, but in this case, it's a dark floor with a shadow. You can't really see um, that much loss in detail. I think it's acceptable, especially for this. You know, this is not a job, so it's okay. I, don't have, I can take a hit on, on quality. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, personally, I don't think it's, it's a problem. Another thing you, that you might see is uh, this area here. It's me light painting the blue light. So... Uh, Got to get rid of that, and uh, it's an easy way of doing that because what I'm doing is I'm actually going to mask out this whole area and replace it with uh, my other exposure of the yellow light painting on this side. So at this corner, if you see this corner right here, this side's going to be blue. This side's going to be yellow, uh, shot with a separate exposure, Okay. So um, getting rid of the camera shadow first, I did that. You can see that uh, it's here, it's gone now, okay? And then now moving back, um, I'm going to take care of this right side area, covering uh, myself at the same time and adding the yellow light. And that's what I did here. Now, when I added the yellow light, you can see that uh, I also um, see another version of me quite a bit blurrier, but that's me painting the yellow side, okay? The other version of me before was painting the blue. Now this is me painting the yellow. I'm in the shot because uh, this ambient light is exposing myself as well as what I'm light painting. So it's inevitable that uh, I also get uh, exposed as well. Now, um, this top area you see here, this piece right here is... Um, 
a bit distracting. I wanted to clean it up. It's a mural. It's got some text and graphics. It doesn't suit the scene. I think it's too realistic. I guess that's the right word. So what I did was that I actually copied this chunk of concrete, flipped it over, and then pasted it over here. Okay. So that's what I did in this shot, in this layer right here. Okay. And if you go into the layer, there's some, you know, tonal adjustments as well. Okay. Now we go into a, a few generative fill sections. Okay. Um, there's a section right down here. You probably can't see it very well. There's a section right here. Um, and there's this section right here to, to fix up the kind of the dirty light painting. Okay. So that um, is all done here. You can see it right about here. Um, I'll turn it on and off. And then this one is this area up here. And then the dirty light painting area cleaned up. Okay. Now. Uh, getting to this spot right here, I originally wanted to get rid of it. Um, I thought it was kind of an oddball thing in this shot where it's so clean uh, that it was distracting. But uh, So I went ahead and did it. But when I did it, it uh, ended up um, being almost too clean. And now it doesn't, uh, it feels like the shot's missing something. So I actually was a bit undecided. What do you think? Should I keep it or should I get rid of it? Um, I, just, I think I'm going to keep it. I think uh, it, it adds something to the scene. It brings, it grounds it somehow and it brings it back to a bit more reality. Even though it's nothing very common, these objects are, I think they're water sprinkler systems for the building. Um, but... Um, Nothing you commonly see, but I, for some reason, it uh, it adds a bit more reality into the sh into the shot. So I'm I think I'm gonna keep it. Uh, the final two things were just uh, remember those two secondary colors. These are the two primary colors, the blue and the yellow. The two secondary colors are magenta and a green. The green was uh, I wanted to add some green to the concrete, uh, a color that I think is indicative of concrete sometimes so i didn't want it to add an unrealistic color to concrete a typical concrete color could be green um normally it's gray but it could be green sometimes when there's a bit of you know mold on it for example so i i did it to uh this area right here this area right here okay and uh that's the spot right here i just added a bit more green right and then the final thing I did was an overall curve adjustment just to increase the contrast a bit, uh, make the image a bit more snappy. The dynamic range of this camera is great. So um, it was pretty much spot on. Even in a low light situation, uh, I didn't have to adjust, uh, you know, recover shadows or uh, highlights that much, just a little bit in Capture One. Uh, so there was plenty of uh, dynamic range, but I think almost too much. I wanted to kind of darken the shadows a little bit here just to add a bit of mood back into the shot. So that's the final adjustment here. I didn't do it to the entire image. You can see that uh, this is the area I focused on. Okay, just the walls. And um, so this is about 90% of the first image. And... Um, I want to take this look and replicate it to the other two images so that all three at the end will look similar in terms of color, uh, contrast, tonal range, uh, basically look and feel, right? You know, remembering the two primary colors, the blue and the yellow, and also the two secondary colors, uh, a little bit of uh, magenta over here and the green over here. So those have to be present as well and those other two images. Just have to figure out a way to balance it all out. But um, this is the step-by-step -step of the first one. And then you can quickly see how I did it to you know the second image, which in this case is um, 
the beginning and I'll just turn everything on. That's the final shot, right? And then the third image, this is the, this is the beginning with nothing. And then this is the final shot. So this one, this one, and that one. All right. Um, I hope you uh, enjoyed this type of vlog. Uh, let me know if this works for you. Uh, it's, again, quite a bit easier to make. And uh, I hopefully I can do more. Maybe you can tell me how to split it up because I still obviously want to do my main uh, more uh, in educational type, more structured type of videos. But sometimes I feel those are a little bit too demanding to make. I wanted to spit out um, videos a lot faster and easier. And that's why I decided to do this type of blog style. But uh, maybe you can help me out. Tell me what types of videos I should do for the main, kind of the main videos, and what types I should do for vlogging style like this, okay? Um, that would help me out a lot. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, of course, like and subscribe if you can. And uh, of course, I do... Um, consultations for uh, photographers, uh, mentoring, and uh, just like to add, yeah, I'm getting quite a few of those uh, inquiries and, and sessions lately. Uh, I just did one uh, recently. The last one I did was from um, Peru, out of all countries. Um, I get a lot from the U.S., uh, and uh, but, all, you know, across the world, uh, Peru, um, Philippines, uh, Belgium, I'm just trying to name all the countries. Uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, like quite a lot of uh, people from around the world. So it's great getting to meet uh, a lot of people. And uh, I'm glad to help them in their journey of photography. Could be anything. Um, I've, I've gotten mostly the inquiries have been about the sessions have been about uh, improving the work, uh, getting into commercial shooting, um, trying to figure out. Uh, what path to take because the path to shooting advertising campaigns is is quite different from shooting for magazines, for example. Uh, quite a bit shoot, uh, different from shooting for social media campaigns. Uh, all quite separate. And um, there's a little bit of overlap, but uh, not a lot. So that's usually the first question I ask is, uh, where do you want to go? And a lot of people want to end up shooting ad campaigns because I guess that's the most prestigious uh, probably the the most lucrative as well, but also the longest path to take. And uh, you know, I caught some people off guard because a lot of you don't realize it, it does take a long, long time to get into the advertising game. Not because, not only because of the 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 skill that you need to acquire, not just the shooting skill, but also the skill to manage people, manage money, manage time, uh, manage. Um, the 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 concept and the ever changing concepts and uh, demanding clients, all that kind of stuff takes a long time to acquire those skills. So, demanding, yes, takes a long time. But I digress. Um, thanks uh, to all of you for supporting this channel. Uh, let me know your thoughts on this vlog, and I'll see you next time.